Books of magic, sometimes called grimoires, are a common symbol of the occult and culture. Along with the magic wand, the flying broom, the magical tome is a quintessential aspect of magic in our cultural imagination. They're present in film, from Fantasia to Evil Dead, in video games, in Dungeons and Dragons, and in many depictions of magicians in art and literature. One can think of the Necronomicon of H.P. Lovecraft. Most of us can even imagine a dusty, arcane book filled with strange symbols and a lock and clasp to keep its secret safe. Despite the symbol being so present, what do we actually know about historical books of magic? What did these texts actually contain? Who wrote them? And how do they survive attempts to destroy them? And what can we learn about the historical practice of magic from these texts? This is the first video in a series here on Esoterica on historic books of magic from the ancient world to the present. In this episode, we'll take a look at a 15th century necromancer's manual. Yeah, necromancer's manual. Known simply as CLM 849. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and this is Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. Well, to begin with, I hate to disappoint you, but CLM 849 isn't bound in human flesh, nor is it inked in human blood, although books like that do exist. The process for binding a book in human flesh is referred to as anthropodermic biblioplegy, and there are a handful of books like this in the world. The only book I know entirely written in human blood is a copy of the Quran commissioned by none other than Saddam Hussein. The Munich Necromancer's Manual, otherwise known as CLM 849, is housed in the Bavarian State Library in Germany, and virtually nothing is known of its early history. It's first mentioned in some academic studies in the early 20th century, but we think the book itself actually dates to sometime around 1450. It's written on paper rather than parchment, which indicates it's not a terribly high value item. Unfortunately, the text was rebound sometime in the 19th or early 20th century. I say unfortunately, because the binding of a text often tells us a great deal about the history and the cultural situation in which a text was actually made. In the Nag Hammadi library, one of the codices actually contained a bit of papyrus called cartonage that actually had a date on it, and that gave us a pretty good idea about when the Nag Hammadi library was produced. The Munich Necromancer's Manual is actually missing the first few folios, which is actually pretty typical of magical manuscripts, and it actually might explain why this manuscript survived. The reasoning being that if you open it up, it's not immediately clear that what you're dealing with is a book of illicit magic. So the first few folios being missing actually may have helped it survive. And it's relatively small, only about eight by five. So if you look, for instance, at this postcard, you can see, right, this piece of paper is roughly the same size as the Munich Necromancer's Manual. And if you compare it to a typical postcard, here my postcard from the Siena Church with Hermes Trismegistus on it, you get a sense about just how small this is. Although that's not terribly unusual for medieval manuscripts. This is a leaf from a medieval, actual medieval manuscript that I have in my collection. And you can see that it's just a little smaller than a postcard. This is from a French book of hours with a little bit of commentary on it. Um, it's quite a nice little manuscript. The main text of CLM 849 is Latin, although there are sections of German and Italian throughout the manuscript. The text also includes passages in what it refers to as Chaldean, which from what we can tell is mostly nonsense, although some of the text actually might be corrupt versions of Arabic, Hebrew, and Greek. For instance, one of the incantations actually begins B-I-S-M-A-L-L-E, Bismele. We think this actually might be a corruption of the Arabic Bismillah, which begins many Islamic prayers. The script is pretty typical of what you might see, for instance, in a university textbook of the mid 15th century. It's heavily abbreviated, the hand is very hurried, and it's often difficult to read. The Latin itself is only semi-learned. That is to say, there are lots of grammatical and spelling problems throughout the text. Sadly, having magic powers doesn't make Latin any easier. If folks on the channel are interested, I'd love to do a video where I actually show how difficult it is to read, edit, and translate a medieval text by doing a very close study of a page from CLM 849. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in that. Lastly, I'll say that the text shows pretty substantial evidence of scribal corruption. For instance, the spelling of demonic names throughout the manuscript varies wildly. In one section of the manuscript, a demon's name might be spelled in one way, 
and later on in the manuscript it might be spelled in a very different way. Sometimes within even a single incantation, the spelling of demonic names can vary. This matters because in most theories of magic, having the exact pronunciation of the demonic name is very important for controlling said demon. Further, the incantations themselves show evidence of being edited together. Sometimes whole words seem to drop out and grammatical cases often make no sense. Sometimes there are even verbs missing. It's as if there are entire sections of the text just missing. This isn't unique to CLM 849, but if scribal precision is needed to affect the magic, I doubt the efficacy of this manuscript. So what do we know about the author of the Munich Necromancer's Manual? The text tells us very little, which isn't terribly surprising. You don't exactly put an about the author section in a book of illegal, illicit magic in 1450. In fact, there may not be an author the way we typically think of that word. The text is primarily a collection of magical recipes, or experimenta to use the language of the text. I think the best analogy here is imagining your grandmother taking recipes from a lot of different books and then editing all those recipes together into a new book. Except for your grandmother is a necromancer. So the author or copyist of the text may be something more like a compiler than the actual originator of the text itself. We just don't know. We think that the author was likely German, not terribly educated. Remember that the Latin of the text itself is rather clumsy. He was probably a member of what is sometimes referred to as the clerical necromantic underground. This may come as a shock to learn that clerics are the same people producing manuals of necromancy, but this makes a bit of sense. Clerics were the primary ritual specialists of their time. That is to say, they had knowledge of Latin, they knew how to perform the mass, they could engage in exorcisms, and they would have had knowledge about angels and demons. They're effectively the only strata of population with any capability in this area. Further, these spells wouldn't have been seen as worshipping the demons, rather manipulating and controlling them through God's power in order to make them useful. One should remember that there's a persistent idea in the Middle Ages of Solomon himself actually using demons to construct the first temple. So the idea of using demons for something useful wouldn't have been totally out of the question. For instance, finding buried treasure or something. So just what is necromancy? Strictly speaking, it's using the dead to predict the future. Although by the Middle Ages, the term means any kind of illicit magic, often involving the conjuration of demons to the magician's will. The manual's modern editor, Richard Kiekeffer, divides the text into three types of necromancy, illusionist, psychological, and divinatory. I want to go through each of the three types and look at a couple of spells in depth. The first group of necromancy we'll look at in CLM 849 are illusionist spells. These spells create illusions like fantastical banquets, the apparent revivification of the dead, magical castles, forms of transport, such as illusory horses, ships, and even flying thrones. I dislike the term illusion a little bit because these spells seem to actually summon these entities for a period of time rather than being what is sometimes referred to as glamour magic or just pure illusion. Generally speaking, these spells contain a couple of shared elements. The first is an exhortation towards secrecy. They tell you to make sure to keep these spells secret and don't tell anyone about them. Secondly, they include testimony about how they've worked in the past. And third, they really widely range in terms of spell complexity. In fact, I would say the most complex spell in CLM 849 is for actually summoning a magical banquet. Let's take a closer look at one of the spells that actually summons a castle and its defenders. Like many spells in CLM 849, this one is introduced as an experimenta, which will, in this case, summon a fine and well-fortified castle, a castrum pulcherimum et folcitum, along with countless legions of armed men. In Latin it reads, armatorum immanusul sic legionis. You can see there's a weird misspelling there and innumerable in Latin. So to summon the castle, one has to go out on a specific night, bare of head and bare of foot, and sprinkle honey and milk into the air in all four cardinal directions while intoning a conjuration to what the text calls 15 squire spirits, or spiritus armigeri. The conjuration itself is pretty typical of missal and exorcism language. For instance, you have to recite the incantation per patrum et filium et spiritum sanctum, per creatorum caeli et terri et visibilium omnium et invisibilium, et per illum qui hominum de limo terri formavit, et per enuncium domini nostri Jesu Christi, et per eus navitatum, et per eus mortum et passionum, et per eus resurrectionum, et per eus escensionum. As you can see, the language is pretty typical of the mass or of an exorcism. 
Along with the conjuration, one also constructs a magic circle with various demonic names on the outside edge of the circle. You can see it on the screen now. You can also use this magical circle to re-summon the castle later without having to do the conjuration with the milk and the honey. What happens next, allegedly, is that the demons appear in the distance, they say something on a mysterious book that you don't understand, then, if you wish, they'll summon for you an entire castle and its knights. Although, after about an hour, apparently, the demons will begin to complain. Although you can bind them longer and use the magic circle to resummon them later in the future. The summoned castle, according to the Necromancer's Manual, only lasts about a quarter of a day at a time, but it can be resummoned later. My favorite part about this is that the anonymous Necromancer even tells us that he summoned this castle once in the past. Apparently, the Emperor and his lords were out hunting, and the Necromancer summoned a bunch of demons, which terrified the Emperor and his lords. After that, the Necromancer summoned the castle, the Emperor and the Lords ran into the castle thinking they were going to die, the demon started laying siege to the castle, and at the height of all this drama, the Necromancer apparently dismissed the entire magical scene, leaving the Emperor and the Lords standing in a swamp. After all this, the Necromancer reveals himself to the Emperor and the Lords, who are apparently still standing in the swamp, and declares to them, Nagokium ex hoc maximum fuit festum. This episode has been quite an adventure. And then it proceeds, hilariously, to quote, Quibus sequentum experientum post canum fakey. And after the experiment, he made them dinner. Needless to say, this episode is pretty hilarious. You have a necromancer summoning demons, terrifying an emperor, who then runs into a magical castle of the necromancer's own creating, and then afterwards, he makes them all dinner. For some reason, this reminds me of the episode of Chappelle's show, where Charlie Murphy challenges Prince to a game of basketball, loses, and then Prince makes pancakes for them all. Needless to say, this is quite a spectacle, and one wonders how exactly the Necromancer was able to escape the wrath of the Emperor and the Lords. I guess he was a pretty good cook. The second group of spells can be described as psychological, in that they seek to affect the mental or emotional states of others. For instance, to induce psychic damage, to produce insanity, to gain favor at court, or to manipulate the wills of others. More specifically, there are four separate spells in CLM 849 for inducing love. I use the word love here as loosely as possible. This spell requires that one bite open the heart of a pure white dove using the blood to draw a picture of a naked woman on parchment made from a dog in heat. The Latin is cane femina dum est in amore. While invoking the quote, spirits of heat, the spiritum calidorum. These Spiritum Calidorum include none other than Satan and Cupid. Yes, Cupid. After the invocation, one writes the name of the salt after woman on the head of the piece of parchment, drawing the demonic names and invocations on various limbs. If you're curious, Cupid goes on the genitals. Then a prayer is made in which the woman will quote, yearn for me through our Lord Jesus Christ. One can wonder what Jesus would think about all this. Then, a fumigation is made using myrrh and saffron, along with three further demonic conjurations. After writing the demonic names in the various body parts of the talisman, one continues with this conjuration. I'll read just a small section of it. Conjuro vos omnes demones in hac imaginare scriptos per dominos vestrus quibis obideri temini, sobidon badalam et berent. These are the three demons that you'll be summoning, apparently. Maybe I should be more careful when I read this stuff out loud. Then you take horsehair and hang up the parchment talisman so that the air can blow it around, and the next day the woman, or victim, of this spell will do your heart's desire and love you above all things for eternity. Tuo animo fecit valentatum et super te omnia diligit in eternum. After you've done all this, if you can't approach the woman for whatever reason, maybe she's a lady of the court or something, there's a further spell, and this is getting even more disturbing, there's a further spell to get the demons to go, snatch her away, drag her into a magical circle, and then magically appear to be her so that no one will know the better. Finally, the necromancer claims that this is the exact same spell that Solomon had when he, quote, had any woman he wished. There are all kinds of troubling things about this spell, not least of which is the fact that there's nothing like consent operating in this love. So my advice is, please use Tinder or something else, anything other than necromancy, to get a girlfriend. The last category we could use for the types of necromancy in CLM 849 are divinatory experiments, 
and this represents the largest group. There are 19 spells in all. These spells range from gaining knowledge of the liberal arts, to locating a thief or a murderer, to making magical mirrors, including a, quote, mirror of Lilith, and various techniques for gazing into surfaces to learn hidden secrets. Sometimes this is called scrying. So lastly, let's take a look at a spell about how one can find buried treasure while asleep. It's a pretty useful spell. So this spell is relatively straightforward. It doesn't require that you bite into dove hearts or anything. So what do you have to do to find buried treasure while asleep? Well, first you have to wake up, confess all your sins on a Sunday under a waxing moon while the sun is in Leo very early in the morning. And then you sprinkle yourself with holy water, reciting a short missile formula along with Psalm 50 in the Vulgate while facing the crucifix. Afterward, one must intone a prayer that begins, O Rabbi, Rabbi, my King and my God. Literally the Latin reads, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rex Mius et Deus Mius. After that, further supplications are made facing east, and then before bed, another prayer is made. This prayer actually summons a spirit that will come to you in your sleep and actually provide you the location of a buried treasure. The next day you can get up, locate the buried treasure, but apparently you have to make sure to give three sets of alms and thanks for your recently found treasure. Now, as you can see, this spell isn't especially difficult, and it also reveals the fact that this is a very clerical kind of text, despite the fact that you're summoning demons and stuff. Further, it reveals a bit of Jewish magic influencing the Necromancer's Manual. In fact, there's a later spell for invoking the quote, Nomen Magnus Simi Foras, which is the Tetragrammaton, the unspeakable name of God in the Jewish tradition. So this text is indeed very cross-cultural. I suppose if I could use a magic spell to locate buried treasure, I wouldn't be terribly picky what religion it came from either. These are only three of the nearly 50 spells, conjurations, and magical techniques to be found in CLM 849. There's simply so much interesting in this text that I couldn't possibly go through it in one video. This video is the first in a series here on Esoterica where we'll be exploring magical books, reaching back all the way to the very beginning of writing to contemporary magical texts. So click below to subscribe, and consider supporting us on Patreon. If you want to learn more about CLM 849, the best text is Forbidden Rites, a necromancer's manual of the 15th century by the wonderful scholar Robert Kikeffer. Kikeffer's book contains the entire Latin text, along with images of the magical circles, demonic names, and magical seals throughout the book, and it contains translations of a selection of the spells and conjurations along with locating CLM 849 in its historical and cultural context. It's an excellent example of scholarship on magic. Make sure to check it out. If you're curious about magic in the Middle Ages, you may also want to check out his smaller book, Magic in the Middle Ages. It's mostly written for an undergraduate audience and is very approachable. He gets into great detail about things, so it's a great text. If you're curious about magic books in Western history, the best introductory text is Owen Davies' Grimoires, A History of Magic Books. It covers a lot of different texts, but is definitely stronger on the period after printing. This book's also great because it talks about the reception of magical texts, not just in Europe, but also in the Americas. It's a really, really great text. Check it out. If you want a more in-depth exploration of magic, I would check out the six-volume Magic and Witchcraft in Europe, which covers the history of magic from ancient times all the way to the 20th century. It's an excellent collection of texts, very well edited, really, really good. I know six volumes is a lot of reading, but magic is just a very complicated topic and it's well worth investigating further. Also, another great collection of books are the Magic and History series. These books provide really in-depth studies of various topics in medieval magic. They can be a little bit on the academic side. They're excellent scholarship and well worth checking out. All these books and their ISBNs can be found in the description below. I highly encourage you to check them out. They're all excellent resources. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.